Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. And you know, the title of the presentation, New Oil Order, and I was preparing the, the notes, so I started to begin to think, and you'll see what I'm saying towards the end of this talk, just how new is this new oil order? And you know, the reason why we use that term really had to do with the technology of shale in the sense that it is fast cycle technology. It gets rid of the, the investment problem that, that you're used to in the sense that you, you make an investment now and you don't see production for, let's say, three to five years. That was the old oil world that we lived in. So we use the word new oil order. It's based upon the idea of the fast cycle nature of shale and the fast cycle nature of the capital, meaning you put capital to work, you get production. Actually, if you did a single well by itself, 14 days later. Um, so what it does is it turns it into a manufacturing process. But when we go through this and we start to think about it, um, I'm really in the last several weeks, I'm beginning to change my mind. You know, is this manufacturing technology, is it the fast cycle nature really changing the world that we used to live in, and let's say going back to the 80s and 90s, and I'm really beginning to question that. And it comes around to the following observation I want to start with, is the stability we're beginning to see take place in long-term oil prices. By the way, this is the three-year-ahead three Brent price forecast. So maybe this is the Conoco guy right out here, still out here at 80, but you can see there's very few people here anymore. You're getting a narrowing of the distribution. And right, now let's compare that to where we were, let's say, in 2008, that green dotted line. You had a high of 180 and a low of 40. So you go back to two years ago when you had the, the Conoco gentleman here, the gray line, actually he was, all, he was a little more on the bearish side at 80. But I think the key point here really is that there's a consensus developing around long-term oil prices. And I think the immediate response I get from most people are going, oh, they're all going to be wrong. Um, no. And the answer is, if I were to ask people in the 1980s and 90s where they saw long-term oil prices, it wasn't a question. It was a $20 commodity. Yeah, it would go to 10 sometimes. It would go to $40 a barrel sometimes. But it always mean reverted back to $20 a barrel. And that was its... Um, marginal cost of production. So are we going back to a world in which we now have mean reversion around something around, let's call it 60, 65, or actually we would argue 55? The answer is yes. It doesn't mean the market's not going to go you know, down to 25 or 30 or up to $100 a barrel again, but it means that we're getting consensus on some long run point of convergence. And when we think about why could you have such a wide distribution of potential price forecasts in 2008? The answer is we had no clue where the oil was going to come from. We had no idea what the technology was going to be. And you know, I like to point out, don't listen to me or Goldman Sachs on technology. I went out and bought Petrobras and believed in the Brazilian pre-salt story. Um, and the reason why we poo-pooed shale was because Exxon told us it was a $125 barrel of proposition. It will never work. Well, guess what? Oil prices went to 147 and they tried it, got government subsidies in North Dakota, and bada-bing, bada-bing, you're sitting here now with it being the dominant technology. We did not know that. And so the key point here is not that there's a consensus developing around the price, here, there's a consensus developing around the technology, the dominant technology. And if you really think about, we didn't even know it was scalable until around 2012. And by 2014, the scalability was shocking. Um, and the returns from investing in it were absolutely impressive such that now to the point that it is by far the dominant technology. You can see that by looking at the evolution of the supply curves in oil. <coughs> These are the supply curves, and we build them up bottoms up, project by project, um, 
around the world and the publicly traded companies and some of the national oil companies at which we can get access to the projects. And let's start with the supply curve in 09. It's the way most people would have thought about an oil supply curve, kind of a hockey stick. But watch how it begins to flatten over the course of the following decade. And actually, if you do the, the new version in 17, which we're just putting together right now, as you might guess, it's even flatter at $55 a barrel. So what is driving that consensus view on long-term oil price? It's that flat part of that curve. And so when we think about, as we go forward, what was driving the decision of OPEC in 2014 to go to a market share strategy? Let's go to your basic dominant firm model, your residual supply curve. Your residual supply curve, as you can see in 2009, was very steep. So if you're the dominant firm, Saudi Arabia, taking supply on and off the market in face of that 2009 supply curve, what happens to price? It goes up and down because of the steepness, the inelasticity of that supply curve. Now look at the one in 2014. Now I'm Saudi Arabia, the dominant firm, taking supply on and off the market against that residual supply curve. What happens to price? Nothing. Why? Because you're stuck on that flat part of that curve. They're taking supply on and off the market right here. And that's where your demand intersects. And I think an important implication of that is not only will cutting output do really nothing to price, increasing output does nothing to price. Substantially so. Obviously, it creates a near-term surplus that the market had to, to deal with. But in terms of thinking about your long-term price implications, again, you're on that flat part of the curve. That's why they shifted to a market share strategy. I'll talk about their most recent strategy, which actually we would argue is consistent with this market share strategy. So the key point here is we developed a new technology that's creating a flat part of the curve. Now the problem with most of these markets is we don't have a lot of data to know what these markets looked like, let's say, 20 years ago. Because it was really with the advent of the technology to be able to start to develop these kind of supply curves. What I'm beginning to think, and why I tend to think that the, the, the world is not that much different today than what it was in the 1980s or 90s, is that that supply curve was perfectly flat at $20 a barrel. And what we end up getting, and I'm beginning to convince myself of, is that this curve is going to be flat at $50 a barrel. Why? I had a meeting with a big integrated oil company in London two weeks ago. They buy into this picture. Their long-term price is right around here, $55, $60 a barrel. What are they doing? Reverse engineering the projects to $50 a barrel. So they take a project that is out here on the tail of this, they're convinced this is a $50 commodity. They re-engineer the projects to bring it down, and that tail is going to flatten out somewhere around $50 a barrel. The OPEC countries, where are their budgets moving to? $50 a barrel. You end up, once you have the dominant technology, the rest of the industry is coalescing around that dominant technology. So let's talk about how you get a dominant technology. And you know, I, I like to point out this is just nothing other than you know, classic investment under, un, under uncertainty, your, your, your classic Pendike Dixit type model. And the way I want to think about it is, have we seen this search for technology before? And the answer is yes. And it is the super cycle for commodities. And I want to focus on the green line. The green line is the age of the energy capital stock in the United States. So when that number's up around 10, the capital stock is somewhere around 10 years old. When it's down around six, it means the capital stock is six years old. And it allows you to identify periods in which you make large-scale investment in new infrastructure. So you did one in the 50s, another one in the 70s, and another one in the 2000s. We created this picture back in 2004, and that's when we came up with the idea of going, this is the super cycle. What I, what I didn't really understand at that point in time is that this is the supply cycle for commodities. The peaks on each one of those cycles is roughly 30 years. I like to point out good, any good equity analyst 
puts a terminal value of most of the assets at somewhere around 30 years. And another point when people like to look at this, they go, well, is it a demand story? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw out some questions for a lot of you to think about because what do we know about the 2000s, the 70s, and the 50s? There was a big emerging market. Who was the emerging market in the 50s? Post-war Europe. Who was the emerging market in the 70s? Japan. Who was the emerging market in the 2000s? China. I'll talk about why I think that you get that dynamic with them, but they're not first order. The first order is a technological story. 50s. We ran out of conventional oil on land. So what did we have to do? We had to go into the water. Think about places like Santa Barbara. So this is the first time we went offshore. What happened right here? By the way, the word peak oil was invented in 1970, right before that market starts to go up. Yes, we like to pin the, the rise in prices here on the Arab oil embargo. Prices by 72 were really already underway going up. You had a supply problem. You ran out of the conventional resource. You're going to have to find some new resource. So ultimately, you end up with prices rising high enough in search of a new technology. We tried oil sands. We tried gas to liquids. By the way, gas to liquids was invented back to here in the, in the um, 40s. So a lot of these technologies, we just try them over and over and over and see if they work. I like to point out with gas to li liquid technologies, the only people who have ever used it were Nazi Germany right here and apartheid South Africa. So you've got to be a world of hurt to get that technology to work. But the point being is that we've tried these technologies time and time again in each one of these phases. So the dominant technology, offshore. Dominant technology, deep water. Dominant technology, shale. But the key point here is that you don't know that going in. And so you go back to your, your basic, classic, Pendike-Dixit investment under uncertainty model, you basically have to get an option premium embedded in that price so you'll go out and make those investments and try those technologies. Because more likely than not, one of these technologies is going to go bad. Um, I like to point out, not only have we tried gas to liquids in all three of these, we've also tried oil sands right here and oil sands right here. It just doesn't work. It may work in another technological cycle at some other point in time, but we don't know how to make it work at this point. Now, when you look at the price over those time periods, you get this dynamic where you have these investment phases followed by the exploitation phase, in the sense that you make the investment in the technology here, you master it, you transition into an exploitation phase, and you exploit the technology in the investments that you made in the previous decade. Another way to say it is you do a lot of E, for those of you who don't know, E and P is exploration and production. You do a lot of the E in the investment phase, and then you just do P in the exploitation phase. So you make the investment and explore here, and then you produce it right there. And you end up with a dynamic with um, high and rising commodity prices during the investment phase, followed by low and declining commodities during the exploitation phase. So let's look at this in terms of thinking about reinvestment rates and what the uncertainty does. Dark blue line is the oil price going back to the 90s. The light blue bars are the reinvestment rates. I like to point out that the lowest level of investment was in 05. Oil prices had moved up clearly up into like $77 a barrel from 20 at that point in time. Why weren't they investing? They weren't investing because they had no clue what to invest in. And part of this goes back to the uncertainty about the technology. I like to point out that at this point right now, if I were to have told you that Saudi Arabia was out of oil, the price of oil would go down, not up. Why? It's because then you would make the investment in that oil sands facility up in Canada because you knew that the Saudis couldn't undercut you. And we can see that by even looking at their free cash flow. Look at their free cash flow at the beginning of that investment phase up there in that 04, 05 period, quite high. And actually, when you think about these investment cycles followed by these exploitation phases, these industries destroy wealth. They're wealth-destroying propositions from the get-go because they're so capital-intensive. They only make money in very short periods of time. 
and then you go back to a period in which they're, they're, they're losing propositions. And it, and it really goes back to the, the, you know, the, the you know, simple type of cobweb model. They're stuck making these large scale investments during these investment cycles, bring all the production online as they go into the um, exploitation phase and then get crushed on the back end. But I think the key there is you, you, you basically go back to this period in the 90s, you had so, you know, basically created the environment for the rise in prices that we saw in the 2000s. And a lot of people like to go, oh, it was China. I go back to Goldman Sachs. <coughs> when I actually, I, I left here in, in late 95, early 96, and joined Goldman then at that point in time. So I basically was there for this whole commodity boom um, bust cycle. And I go back, what were the three big calls that Goldman made in the late 90s? Long commodities, why? The story was long commodities due to decades of underinvestment, of poor returns. Going back to this picture right here. You had poor returns throughout the 80s and 90s such that you did not make enough investment in the ability to produce the commodity. In fact, we called it the revenge of the old economy. We had pumped too much money into the new economy, starving the old economy and the investment that it needed. So when we think about as we moved into that 2000s, our story had nothing to do with China. It was a supply side story. What was the other big theme? The other big theme was you wanted to be short the dollar. Why? Because you had Greenspan, you know, he had just come off as a, a rational exuberant speech. Um, you had um, interest rates far too low coming out of the 2000s. So it was a consensus view. You wanted to be short the dollar. Then the other big theme that we had was BRICS. Brazil, Russia, India, and China. It had nothing to do with the dollar. It had nothing to do with the commodity story. Uh, what was it? It was an urbanization story. Just you simply see all these people move out of the rural areas of China, create a low cost source of labor, and you wanted to be long these parts of the world. They, we had no clue going into this decade that they would be a, all three stories would be a potent concoction as you go out there. The problem is we don't have any numbers on things like way currencies traded pre Bretton Woods. We don't know what this period looked like. But my guess is you had the same potent concoction um, between Japan, the dollar, and commodity prices. Because you get a dynamic in which they feed off. I'm going to go into it in a minute about how they feed off one another. But I think it's critical to, to the story. But to recognize that. It's not a China story, it's not a dollar story, it was a supply side story um, back to the 90s. And so when we think about, you had that period, high commodity prices, people started getting confidence by, as you can see, 2011, 2012, even at 2013 and 14, you're at $100 a barrel, notice how those reinvestment rates really start to tick up. Actually, uh, let, me, let me just go back a picture so you can see it there. That's the price of oil. 14, you've got reinvestment rates starting to really pick up. Why? Because people started to have confidence, hey, oil sands doesn't work. Hey, that Brazilian um, pre-salt was a bad idea. Let's make investments in the shale. So then everybody moved into the dominant technology. You can see by 15, you're at your peak reinvestment rates because everybody knew that's the place you wanted to put your money. And I think the key point there is that part of the reason we had to go to 147 over the previous decade was to pay for that uncertainty, to make those investments, to try these different technologies, to settle on which one ends up being the dominant technology. So let's look at what the world looked like when prices fell in 2015. Here's the supply curves across the different technologies. <coughs> you had the ultra deep water um, with, the, with the, you know, the tail up there. It was scalable, like shale, but you can see the scalability was at far higher cost than what shale was. And then you had your more traditional conventional resources like deep water. Heavy oil is the Canadians. You can see you don't want to be a Canadian here. We've tried this over and over and over. It just doesn't work. It's the gray line here, um, or actually it's the blue line. It only beats shale right there. The rest of it is uneconomic. 
So sorry to those that made large-scale investments in heavy oil. They should have learned their lesson from the previous cycle. But I have to say, in 2005, we didn't know. I was out preaching oil sands, oil sands. It's a $55 a barrel cost basis. What happens? If there's one thing I've learned over the last 20 years of doing this, everything that you look at in terms of what the engineers tell you the cost basis will be, you get into these projects, you scale them up, they get far more complicated than what anybody thinks. And when you scale them up, you run into the bottlenecks. Sometimes we've seen scaling it up where the costs go down, um, but it becomes um, very uncertain at the beginning of making these investments. Now when we think about what has to happen, everything sitting above that shale curve needs to be chopped out. That's, that's the cost of that investment phase over the previous decade. You either need to rationalize those projects or get rid of them. Now, the what happened next is something that I think it happened in telecoms um, during the wireless revolution, and, and I think this would be as an interesting topic for research, is you don't see this very often. This is what you were stuck with after that shale revolution. Here's the balance sheets of all these different companies. So this is the amount of leverage they're running. So 10% would be like an Exxon Shell or somebody like that. Somebody running 60, 70% leverage, that's gonna be those US shale guys. You don't see that where the good assets, the low cost assets are held by the guys with the bad balance sheets the high quality assets are held by the guys with the um, strong balance sheets. Usually that thing is an upward sloping curve. Strong balance sheets have good assets, bad balance sheets have bad assets. Not this way around. Which then really complicated the story and why the market got so vicious to the downside in late 15 and 16 is because this thing didn't have a natural solution. Because typically what happens? You would have the, the strong balance sheets buy out the guys with the, um, the bad balance sheets or, and then rationalize the good assets out of it. The problem is these guys had access to capital because they had the technology. Guys like Shell and Exxon didn't have the technology. Actually, it's an important question. Why didn't Shell and Exxon and BP have the technology? And I look at the mistake they did in the 90s. In the 90s, they left the U.S. Why? Is because they assumed that the cost basis was too high. They knew shale existed. It was considered five, six dollar gas. The oil was off the charts, 125, 150 dollar oil. It wasn't worth their while sticking around. So they sold all these assets to these little chump players at the time. You know, ones that actually be Anadarko, Chesapeake, and the rest of them picked up the assets. Now, where did they go? They went to the international arena. They went to places like Venezuela, North Africa. And the reason why they went to places like that is they wanted $3 gas as opposed to $6 gas in the United States. And they wanted $30 crude or $20 crude as opposed to $30 or $40 crude. And what did they learn? You look back over the last decade, is that by targeting low cost projects, as opposed to diversifying across technology, they ended up with their $3 gas turning into $15 gas. Let me repeat that. Their $3 gas turned into $15 gas. What happened to the guys in the US? Their $6 gas turned into $2 gas. So their cost basis, the guys in the US, that's how you ended up with this picture. These guys thought they were down here, but ended up up there. And these guys thought they were up there, but ended up down here. You had a rotation in that outcome. Moral of the story is diversify across technologies, because you don't know what the cost basis is actually going to look like. So now we move to today. What does this picture look like today? This is this consolidation that we're beginning to see around the long-term oil prices. <coughs> this is why people are getting confidence that that point of mean reversion is somewhere in this $55 a barrel range. You're now beginning to see rationalization of assets, rationalization of the underlying cost structure to something uh, more akin to $50 to $55 a barrel. And that's why I'd argue that, hey, this thing is probably a mean reverting commodity somewhere around $50 a barrel. Let me go over one more point, is what happens to countries like Angola? Now, I'd like to point out Kazakhstan has already done this. Had Kazakhstan not done this, 
They would go back to being Borat in the sense that here are the supply curves of these different countries building up the supply curve with the taxes embedded. As you can see, you've got these countries out at the end, particularly these West African countries. They don't have any diversification. They have got one choice and only one choice is to make themselves competitive to shale. And we're beginning to see that happening there. They take their cost bases down. Angola, Nigeria, and the rest of them fall in line, come below the U.S. shale guys. So I go back to why is, is this really the new oil order? Or did we see this in the 80s? Mm -hmm. uh, can you just walk through uh, in more detail? So what's, the, what's driving the move from right to left for okay. Okay, if, if you know that the dominant technology is the U.S. shale at $55 a barrel, I'm Angola, I'm up there closer to 80, but most of that's tax. They have like a tax rate of somewhere around 85% to corporates. The rest of the world runs one around 35%. And so I'm Angola, and right now Angola is saying no. They're going no to the, to the to super major. Super major is going, hey, look, we don't have any shale, you don't have any shale. If we want to be profitable and you want to have a, re a resource base, get your taxes down below that U.S. shale guy. And essentially, we're beginning to see that happening. So how much of this is tax driving that group above the U.S. shale? What you find, the Canadians already have low taxes, is everybody but the Canadians can get below the Americans. And so what, what I have actually think happened and reason why you were so convinced of that point of mean reversion to $20 a barrel in the 80s and 90s is once you establish the dominant technology, which was deep water in the 80s and 90s, everybody coalesced around it. They had no choice. And it, we're beginning to see that. And I, I tend to think that when we make this picture, when we make this picture in two to three years from now, my bet is the whole thing is just flat at $50 a barrel. Because what would you do if you're one of these guys down here? Raise your taxes. Because you know that, event, that, that you've got that protection. And so what ultimately ends up, you just end up with something pretty flat around, let's call it $50 a barrel. And I think that's what happened in the 80s and 90s. We don't have enough data to know. But my guess is you ended up with a pretty much a flat curve around the cost basis of deep water technology. So we've talked about the technology. Now I want to talk about how the market prices it. And I want to start with this idea, oops, let's go back about separating the supply and demand of capital versus the supply and demand of molecules of energy. Because the markets are very different. They price differently and they have very different implications. And if there's one thing I've picked up over the last two decades of doing this is the capital markets are more important than the barrel of oil markets or the molecules of gas markets. And so how do they price differently? These are two hypothetical forward curves for oil. Now when we look at, I always like to ask people, how do you value a commodity? It's amazing how many people can go tell me, how do you value an equity? You know, it's a discounted sum of future earnings, dividends, or a, or a bond. It's so shocking how few people know how to value a commodity. It goes back to economics 101, P equals MC. Uh, and if you throw in some type of market structure in there, you could get it a little bit above marginal costs. But the reality is, the reason why people miss this point is, let's say the marginal cost is $45 a barrel. You don't actually really ever see the spot price pricing at $45 a barrel. It's all over the place. The reality is, it's that back end of that forward curve that ultimately converges to that marginal cost of production. And so when we like to think about, we look at the price of a commodity, I like to use it P equals MC plus D, where it's the marginal cost plus some delivery premium or discount as measured by the shape of that forward curve. And so what we see is that you get this convergence of the back end to some measure of marginal cost, and then the shape of the forward curve prices your level of inventories as a supply and demand of the actual molecules of the energy. And so this is your bear market. Why? Spot prices sit below forward prices. The reason why is because 
You buy the commodity today at 40, sell it forward at let's say 45 here, it better pay for your cost of storage, right? So you're building inventories, it's a bear market. So upward sloping forward curves are bearish. Downward sloping forward curves are bullish, why? I like to point out, you're willing to pay a premium to have that commodity today as opposed to tomorrow because you don't have enough. And so we think about near-term fundamentals as being reflected in curve shape. The supply and demand for capital or the marginal cost of production is being reflected in the back end of the forward curve. So let's look at how the market prices. Picture on the left shows you how the shape of the forward curve prices. The dark blue line is the shape of the forward curve measured on the far right axis here. It's the spot price versus the five year forward. And it's upside down axis. It's um, you know, plus 70% on the bottom to a minus 50 at the top. So it's a negative correlation with the inventories here on the left, which are the gray, the gray line. I want to focus on December 99. December 99, the gray line, your inventories are 10% below the three year average, so you're short oil but the spot is sitting 50% above the back end. So the back end was anchored at 20, the front end was at 30, because you were out of inventory. Then let's go to December 09, the opposite problem. Too much inventory, now the spot is roughly 50% below the back end. The spot was at 35, the back end was at 70. And so you get a very well-defined relationship between the shape of the forward curve of these commodity markets and the level of inventories. The picture on the right shows how the back end of that forward curve prices. That's the five year forward. It prices off the marginal cost of production. Why is that? I like to point out in my 20 years of being at Goldman, I've never walked into the offices of Exxon Mobil. Why? Because they have absolutely no need for us. They don't need to manage their risk because they're intermarginal. They're down the bottom of that supply curve. Who do we deal with? People who are at the top of that supply curve, the marginal players who are actually getting hit with the need to actually use risk management project, pro products, things like hedging. And so the natural player on the back end of these forward curves will be the high cost player because they're the ones that are actually required to hedge. And what are the reasons why you hedge? One, lower your cost of capital. Two, diversify your risk. Take a, a US E&P player today. They just produce oil, so they need to diversify their risk, and they have a relatively high cost of capital. They're the ones who are active in these markets. So when we think about, you know, I said before, we look at the, the, the molecule market, it's cleaning up. You can see our forecast, it's tightening. That means that curve is getting flat and move into a backwardation. The problem is the back end of that curve, that's pricing capital, nobody wants to go away. It's sticky. That's private equity dry powder, $80 billion sitting around trying to find something to do in this industry, which means it just keeps coming. It'll keep buying the assets, redeploy the assets, they just don't go away. And that's the equity market. Notice in 15 and 16 when you had low prices, these guys could still issue equity all day long. I think part of it is that there's no other alternatives out here. Look at the high yield market versus um, the oil price. It's been relatively resilient. These guys can issue equity, they can issue debt, and they can hedge on the back end of the forward curve. And actually, the point that I, I want to point out here that I've come to the conclusion is that when we think about these markets in as different asset classes out there, there really is three asset classes. There's debt, there's equity, and there's risk capital. And risk capital is what's be typically being traded out on the back end of that forward curve. So we've talked about how the market prices. I want to spend a little bit talking about the implications of a new equilibrium in the oil market. <clears throat> and I want to talk about it in the context of the following observation. Let's go back to September 2000. Oil prices were at $38 a barrel. <clears throat> Clinton used the SPR. The SPR is a strategic <coughs> petroleum reserve. Nobody had ever done it politically. Why? Because every macroeconomist told him if oil prices go to $40 a barrel, the global economy is dead. So he tamed prices, got them back into the 20s. What happened over the following five years? Boom, went above 40, 50, 75, $100 a barrel. Nothing ever happened. 
global growth kept firing ahead, got faster, stronger, and stronger. What happened last year, first quarter of last year? Oil prices go to $26 a barrel. The global economy nearly shuts down. What is the only possible explanation for that? Is that oil creates credit. Oil is a point of leverage to be able to improve financial conditions to the global economy. Opposite of what we were told in the 70s. In the 70s, the reason why there was a belief, we'd never seen oil prices go above 40. And we knew in the 70s, they went up to those levels, it was going to kill off growth. And the core difference, and this is really what creates that viciousness that we saw over the last decade, is that in the 70s, when you accumulated petrodollars, they bought gold bars, Rolls Royces, and parked it out in the middle of the desert. In the 2000s, they parked those petrodollars in banks, financial, hedge funds, sovereign wealth funds. This capital was used to create wealth and create new financial products. So let's talk about what happened over that time period. Again, we have our two equilibriums. Here's where the market started to become unanchored, where you had to go searching for that technology. 03, 04, and prices began to explode. It's that unanchoring that created that wealth. And that wealth, and I'm going to talk about it in a second, created correlations across assets. Because one thing that appeared, and I can remember sitting there kind of ignoring it in 03, 04, was a sharp correlation between oil and the dollar. As you can see, it's hard to tell the difference between the oil price and the dollar over most of that previous 15 years. So I want to talk about this correlation and what it created and why you see the Japans and the Chinas um, during these bull commodity stories. I want to talk about the relationship between the dollar, oil, and emerging markets. And, I, let's, and we started to really understand this. I kind of had some clue in the 2000s, but it was around 2015, but it began to hit you in the face. So let's start at the top of this cycle with the shale revolution. It leads to lower energy prices, which started to stimulate growth. Actually, it was more the availability of the supply of gas because it made the U.S. more competitive from the rest of the world. This then allowed the central banks to begin to exit the QE or become, pursue less accommodative monetary policy. So you had low oil prices creating stimulating activity that then allowed them to exit um, QE, which led to a stronger dollar. But what did the stronger dollar do? Started to raise funding costs in places like China and the emerging markets. It started to squeeze them. And okay, all of a sudden I'm in Brazil my Brazilian real is weakening. What do I do? I start adding more commodity supply. I start producing more soybeans, more oil, more all these commodities because my profits begin to improve because of a weaker um, Brazilian real. More commodity supply does what stimulates more growth in the U.S. And we, we end up with an environment that begins to reinforce itself in the sense that then you had the fact that you ended up in thinking about in the dollar terms, it became, um, actually, I actually like to make this point is, when you look at the dollar, and you look at the weakness in the dollar, what happened is well, that weak dollar pushed the US out to the end of that supply curve. And as, as you go forward and you end up with a stronger dollar, it begins to also reinforce it by pushing the US further down that supply curve to even become that much more competitive which then gets you to the other side. And so we look back at what happened over that time period. I go back to the, the why do, actually I figured it out just as about a year ago, why all three of these stories look identical over the previous decade. It boils down to September 11th. China won in the WTO for 15 years. How did they get in the WTO? September 11th happens. September 13th because Wall Street was shut down. They, the Fed flooded the world with dollar liquidity because they had to get dollars into the global system. That kicked off that weak dollar era. The next day, on September 14th, the U.S. calls up China and goes, you want to get the WTO? You've been waiting to get in for 15 years. You vote tomorrow in the U.N. Security Council to let us use force in the Middle East, you're in the WTO. 
So within a four-day time span, you kicked off the weak dollar era, you let China and the WTO, and you took oil supply out of the Middle East. That's why these three stories look identical, but then they fed off of each other. Because think about this, as you ended up with a weaker dollar, it lowered funding costs to China, which allowed them to grow faster, they consume more oil, leads to higher oil prices. Higher oil prices reinforce a weaker dollar. Weaker dollar begins to reinforce stronger growth in China. This went on and on and on and on and on. It's a negative feedback loop. It does not have an equilibrium until finally you have to create something like the shale revolution to slam you back into an equilibrium. And then it worked really hard the other direction as well. But we think about what was the, the glue that created this correlation across all of these? It's the global excess savings. I mean, you've heard about the global excess savings, but here's the oil price. Up and down here, changes in oil prices versus global excess savings. Higher oil prices lead to more global excess savings. So let's go back to this whole the idea of long-term oil prices stability. Here's our global excess savings. When does it really start to kick up? Right about here, right after September 11th. Oil prices started to rise. And think about this, if the old point of mean revergence, what convergence was $20 a barrel, what was Saudi budgeting for in 03? $20 a barrel, what did they get? 32. What did they do with that $12 a barrel? This time around, they put it in savings. It goes into the global financial markets. What is this line right here? Global financial OTC markets. We're not talking about chump change here. You can see it gets up to around $7 trillion. That does not include the Abu Dhabi Investment Authority, the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund. You put it all together, it gets closer to a peak of around 11. Here is the, the OTC markets. We built a financial system on top of that excess savings. That's why this capital would go in and produce, improve financial conditions as oil prices went higher. In fact, if you look at the correlation between oil prices in, this, um, in the dollar and oil prices in, let's say, base metal prices, all those correlations kicked up with the rise in the excess savings because that excess savings was essentially the mechanism that actually facilitated these correlations. Now, why did oil have such a large impact? I'm gonna throw this one up for many of you to think about. Everything started to look like the oil price throughout the previous decade. Here's just the price of all globally traded goods. That's the oil price. Which one's which? They all started to look the same. That's why now China's excess reserves are going up and down with the oil price. And which is why you had to break that chain and it took something like the shale revolution to actually break that chain. And here, you know, to put it in perspective, if you look at the period of the previous decade, this is, this is an impulse response function of hitting our macro model with higher oil prices. Higher oil prices in the current environment improve financial conditions through this mechanism. And that's really, I think, the key point here is that that's why you had these dynamics that took place over the previous decade. I think it happened in the 70s as well to a lesser extent, but they feed off of one another. But I think the, the point being here is in the 80s and 90s, this, our experience from the 70s holds true, but in the 2000s, it's an entirely different experience because of the existence of that excess savings. Now, why did I start this by talking about a consensus developing around long-term oil prices? Saudi can hit their targets now. That's what this technology does. So now, you look at, so 13 and 14, Saudi's running big surpluses adding capital in the global market. Why does it get the correlation with the dollar? Saudi gets all this extra money. They dump it in global financial markets. That puts downward pressure on the dollar. Narrows credit spreads, puts downward pressure on treasury yields. Then what happened in 15 and 16? It was the opposite. The shale revolution broke that chain. And now Saudi Arabia is going, give me my money back, give me my money back, strengthens the dollars, widens credit spreads, and puts upward pressure on treasury yields. Now we're going into an environment in which that point of mean reversion is much more predictable. If you go back to the 80s and 90s, they would budget for 20, and even if it went to 40 that year, they'd end up with something like 22. They never got rocked by being off by 12, $20 a barrel like they were most of the part, 
And what we're beginning to see is a breakdown of that correlation. And I think what, what it says is even you think about like, let's say central banks, before they had that natural shock absorber of higher oil prices being buffered by um, weaker um, exchange rates. That's not gonna be the case going forward. We're going back to a period very similar to the, to the 80s and the 90s. I, where I wanted to talk about now is just finally finish up. I got about 10 minutes here. I wanna talk about demand. We've talked about supply and the connection between prices of oil, existence of excess savings, stimulating to do demand growth in China. I wanna make sure everybody sees that, that you had the excess savings. The excess savings led to a weaker dollar, lower funding costs because of just more capital availability, which then stimulated growth in the emerging markets. They grow faster, consume more oil, and perpetuate the cycle. How did it go back the other direction? Shell revolution pushes oil prices below their budgets. Now they go, give me the money back. It tightens up the dollar, tightens up credit conditions, slows growth in the emerging markets. And that's why you have that feedback loop that works between these different stories. So I've said you know, that before, if there's no longer a supply story here anymore, that shale has solved the supply story, I still am excited about commodities. It's just gonna be a demand story. Now why do I point out, I have say the following saying, demand drives these markets on a one to two year horizon, supply drives these markets on a two to 10 year horizon. It's because of those investment patterns. And so what happens, you think the front end of that curve whips around due to demand, the back end of that curve, those level shifts are being driven by supply. So let's talk about the supply curve with the demand. So here we are with the super cycle, the blue line. That's your supply cycle. The business cycle is in between. That's your demand cycle for commodities. So you have the investment cycle there on the outside that drives supply. That story is pretty boring now. As you can see, doesn't mean the story in oil and commodities is not going to be interesting. It's going to be more high frequency and driven by what's going on in the demand space. So let's talk about how do commodities perform across the business cycle. And I want to start with this hypothetical picture of different phases of the business cycle. And I want to do what we call would be phase one. That's below capacity and shrinking. We like to use the output gap as a measure of that. Um, typically, you want to be in bonds in that environment because why central banks are cutting rates. Then you move into phase two, which is below capacity and growing. That's the anomaly of this last business cycle. We were in phase two from June of 2009. I'd argue today we're now transitioning into phase three. We were in this one way too long. But when you think about commodities, <coughs> when do you want to own oil and commodities? I'm not telling you the market's not gonna go past $55, $60 a barrel, so why do I say you wanna be long commodities? It actually goes with the curve shape. I may be saying things that are far, actually, if there's one thing I can recommend all of you do before you leave here, go out and construct a bond index, a commodity index, and an equity index, and know where the returns come from, because I'm gonna try to explain it here. Let's say I'm long oil. I'm right here. I'm long oil and nothing happens to this market. Eventually, I'm gonna roll down this curve, right? I'm gonna lose money. Let's say I'm long oil on that top curve. What happens? I roll up the curve. It's the carry. And I, the, the older I get, the more I begin to think that the whole world is just one big carry trade. That price appreciation really doesn't do that much in that whether if you know, you're holding onto the position, what's the cost of holding onto it? In that dark blue curve, that's where you make money in being long commodities. So let's say I say the price of oil is gonna be 60 and do absolutely nothing, but underlying fundamentals force that curve into that shape, which means you get tight fundamentals, you end up with the ability to roll up that curve, which is why I go back as we go into phase three of this business cycle, you're gonna see the outperformance of commodities. So I wanna make the point, why is that? Let's think about what oil is. Oil is what we call a spot asset. Stocks and bonds are what we call anticipatory assets. And God, I, I need to put my, my money where my mouth is and repeat that for my own self because I made a big mistake. Is that after that OPEC announcement in November last year, we recommended our clients go out and get long oil. 
Wrong answer. Why? What if I were to tell you with perfect certainty Saudi Arabia was going to blow up in six months time, just completely evaporate all 10 million barrels per day of it? What would you do? You would go out and buy six month out oil, right? You'd take the front of that curve and do that to it, right? Out six months out. What would that do to today's oil market? I would take all the oil today, put it in storage and sell it forward six months, right? That would do what? Create a shortage today and that curve would do that. All that oil would flow back out today. You can't price it in. Commodity markets are spot assets. What about equities and bonds? They are anticipatory assets. They can price in. If I told you with perfect certainty Saudi Arabia is going to blow up, what's going to happen? The equity would go up. You gave the currency to these people. They spend it. They drill for oil. Bring on enough oil in six months from time. Problem solved. So the point being is that your stocks and bonds are anticipatory assets, commodities are spot assets. If your economy is overheating in phases three and four, that's when you want to be long oil. It doesn't mean the price is going to be go up, it's that carry is going to get tight. I'm not going to go into that, it's probably beyond the, the scope of this discussion. But the reason why I bring this up is that it's the cyclicality now that's going to be critical to your outlook on commodities and oil, not that supply side story anymore. And let's look at the, the oh, and actually another point here. Let's, let's go back to where we were a year ago. And it, when we think about a year ago, supply was up here, demand was down here. We knew we were in a surplus. Did you want to be long oil in that environment? No, it had a big negative carry. Did you want to be long the oil equity? Yes, because if you took the demand growth rate, you knew supply and demand were going to cross. You were going to get a deficit market. So you want to be long the equity, but not the commodity. But once you supply crosses demand, and we saw evidence of it this morning, you want to be long the commodity because the level of demand is above the level of supply. And here's the point I want to leave you with, is that oil and commodities depend upon activity levels, not growth rates. Financial markets depend upon growth rates. Because it's that growth rate that tells you when the two are going to cross. It's the level of demand being above the level of supply is when you want to be long the commodity itself. So, I just want to make this point, is that it kind of makes the point about the Trump effect and, and Brexit, is these are phases three and four of all these business cycles. The dark blue line are commodities, mainly oil and metals versus equities. The light blue line are oil and metals relative to bonds. What do you see in the second half of every one of those business cycles? Outperformance of the commodities, mainly oil. How do every one of those business cycles end? You run out of oil actually. You know, you know, even in 08, you say China ran out of oil. Yeah, you had a credit crisis in the US, but the rest of the world ran out of oil. So the point being here is once demand gets above supply, you end up with that level of demand above that level of supply, creating the stress on the system. Now there's another point I want to emphasize here is how small these markets have become relative to the financial markets. This is that point that, that capital has grown substantially. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. In fact, I've argued this is the demand side story. Right. And you'd argue, you were already, this is 72. Look at that, you were already there. Yeah. The demand was already ahead of the supply. You had the word peak oil invented in 1970. That's why I think the, this is the demand side of the story. That supply side of that story going into this time period, the seeds were already sown way back in the 50s and 60s. And similarly, when you went to those other times here. So that's why I like to really distinguish where we are in the demand cycle from where we are in the, the supply cycle. But the one point I want to emphasize here is, one, you can't see that super cycle in commodities relative to the bond markets in that time period, which underscores how big that rally in the bond markets were. But I want to make a point about how small these real assets are. And I want to go back to a story about, I went to go visit the SAFE, the State Agency of Forex in China. This is in 05. I went in to see him and 
the, he was a CIO there, and he goes, the only reason why I'm seeing you is, is your head of your London office said I need to talk to you about oil prices. Otherwise, I have no desire to see you. Why didn't he have any desire to see me? He goes on to tell me, he goes, I got to spend roughly $45 billion a month. Exxon, the largest equity in the world, has a monthly turnover of $6 billion. I cannot trade equities. He goes, I have no choice but to trade bonds, treasuries. And he goes on to tell me that your puny little oil market with $300 billion of market cap serves me absolutely no purpose. Get out of my office. And I think it underscores just how small these markets are. How did this thing go to 147 in, in the 2000s? I think he ended up buying oil. See, he, think about it. He had, everything was dollar denominated. What are the big dollar denominated assets in the world? Treasuries. Then you run into, he went into mortgage-backed securities, obviously, in the mid-2000s. Commodities. Commodities are all dollar denominated. And that's actually an important point when you ask, I'm going to go back to this question. I'm not, I'm not going to be, you know, the, put on my tin hat as a commodity guy here. When Nixon took us off the gold standard in the 70s, he went to Saudi Arabia, and we now figured this out in last year. He went to Saudi Arabia. And he says, in exchange for protection of the kingdom, this is 73, um, we're going to, we want you to do two things. Price oil in dollars, and two, take any excess savings and buy U.S. treasuries. Now, of those two, which one was the most important? Pricing in dollars or buying U.S. treasuries? It's actually buying U.S. treasuries. It didn't matter what you priced oil in. If you priced oil in pounds sterling, they'd still have to go back, convert it back to dollars to buy the treasuries. I'd argue that's what gives rise to a lot of this, is that dynamic. And I think the key point there, though, has to do with the fact that when we look at, um, actually, I just went past it, that dom denomination in dollars is that that was one of the key reasons why you saw further investment back into the commodity sector is because it is dollar denominated. So point being here is these markets are relatively small relative to the rest of the financial markets. I like to point out all the commodities, you know how much is invested, how much I deal with? Basically about $120 billion. The market cap of what Apple is what? Is it a trillion dollars now? It's up there. It's around 800, 900 billion. So all of it is one eighth of what's in, in, in commodities relative to Apple. I'm just going to leave you with the following, you know, in terms of the demand story. Um, we're seeing the, re -acceler the acceleration in growth going into the second half of this business cycle like you see every other time. Um, at the same time, the level of demand is pushing up towards 100 million barrels a day. Um, we argue that's what's going to stress this market. Is it going to materialize in a run up of prices to $150 a barrel again? Unlikely. You know, our target is in that $55 to $60 barrel range. But the key is going to be that shape of that curve. It's going to get backwardated, and that's what people are going to be able to roll up over that time period. Um, why is the world, I started this, is, you know, is this the new world or new oil order? What does the new oil order do? It's allowing the flatness of that supply curve in these low cost players to ramp up production without significant damage to prices. What happened in the 80s and 90s? That's OPEC production. It increased tremendously over that time period. It's not like we haven't seen this before. Um, you know, then you look at the shape of the curve. It went into what we call the backwardation. Again, I, I'm, this is probably f too far above. Let's keep it simple. There's the investment in Saudi, Kuwait, o -E -O -E -O UAE, Oman, Algeria, Venezuela, your high cost players. Look at that red line going up. Everybody else is not investing. It's because, hey, they see that plateau on that supply curve that gives them that protection to do it. Um, Russia investment going up. Um, Iraq, de-bottlenecking. You put all the OPEC countries together, um, you know, they're aiming to relatively high production. And they should because of that flatness of that supply curve. But again, I'd like to point out, we saw this in the 80s and 90s. So is this really a new oil order? Yes, the technology is different. But Saudi production can be turned on and off, fast cycle, just like any of the other production out there. And I'll just finally give you our price forecast. It's boring. It's boring because we have a flat supply curve. It doesn't mean that this market's not going to have volatility into it. Demand's not going to drive you up and down. It's just going to mean revert back to something. That the unanchoring of that long-term price over the previous decade is finished. Reason being, we know what the dominant technology is. We know what that point of mean reversion is. I'm going to leave it at that. And I have a few more minutes to open it up for any questions or other issues people would like to address.
$1,000 a barrel. I'm going to give you the two offsets. Why did you have $20 a barrel in the 80s and 90s? Because you had technological progress that then put downward pressure on, on prices through productivity or through cost. But then you had inflationary pressures. As you increased activity, you put upward pressure through a lack of labor. Um, we know we're increasing activity again on because you know you had the collapse in prices, activity collapse, activity is picking back up again. Um, that likely leads to some type of cost inflation. So the productivity gains likely get offset by the inflationary gains. Now, I ultimately, do we get a downward drift closer to 45, 50? Yeah, I tend to think so. Um, how long does this go on? Probably another 10 years. But I don't think you're going to get another big repricing. Zach, we put, we, it was in May, actually it was May 15th of uh, 15, we published our long-term prices at the same one we had today, 50-55. We haven't taken it down, so. Um, in fact, that's when we had the, the piece we put out in June of, or January that year, lower for longer. Um, and we, we were way out there in terms of being big bears at that point in time, and I think the, it, it is more of, it's just the whole industry is coalesced around it which makes it just not that more interesting. But I think the demand side stories are where the focus needs to be, and that's going to create some interesting dynamics. Mm -hmm. uh, so if I, go, if I uh, think back to your slide uh, that had the supply curves mm -hmm. for uh, shale and the, and the different resources, mm -hmm. uh, and I kind of aggregate them into a resource cost curve, I mean, I see that um, out toward the end, we have a kind of a steep end of the cost curve. The last few barrels into the market are, are expensive. Yep. Um, and so I guess there's this kind of question of uh, over the next few years as we see demand grow, how much can shale grow? And how much are we going to still need investment in those in that sort of top end of the cost curve um, to, to kind of, you know, the last mile in the market? Or do you guys really see like everything but Canada or so Canada kind of gets pushed off and then, you know, these guys cut their tax regimes and so that's kind of the flat end of the market now. Yeah, the, the, the answer to that question um, is, this is the point I say and I picked up last week, I was, two weeks ago I was in London. Um, one of the big super majors there is that's up there on that far right, they're just reverse engineering the projects. Right, one example would be BP's Mad Dog in the Gulf of Mexico. It was $85, $95 a barrel. Um, they just re-engineered it to 45. And so I guess what I'm saying about the new oil order is we, I think we saw this in the 80s and 90s. Once they knew that dominant technology created the 20 and you had the consensus developed around it, everybody's forced, you know, whether well, it's Saudi Arabia, they had to have their budget at 20. Now they have to have their budget at 51. Um, BP has to reverse engineer everything to that dominant technology. So my, my question is in 2018 when we make the supply curve, is it just flat? I think that's what happened in the 80s and 90s. I don't know, because we don't know what these things look like. But my guess is, once you knew the dominant technology, everybody coalesced around it. And so does it matter how big shale is? Because that's the biggest question, the question you just asked, I get from most of our clients. How much can it grow? Where do you get to that other part of that, that, that the, the hockey stick of the supply curve? I don't think you ever get to the hockey stick of the supply curve. Or you're kind of saying there, that, that, that that is not going to stay a hockey stick. Yeah. In fact, actually, here's the picture that kind of makes that point. That, there's another way to look at the hockey sticks. Everything that sticks, sticks up above shale, dead. Or that gets reimbursed, it gets re-engineered, reverse engineered, such that it's profitable at that shale line. Right, that's the point, because it, it's not that it, can, it can't really be, quote, it can't totally be dead. I mean, we're not gonna do 100 million barrels a day of just US shale, right? But, but also another thing to think about too is, this includes the capital costs. A lot of this stuff, after you've made the fixed cost investment, this is, the this is the supply curve based upon the next five years of projects. Once you've got one of these big ultra deep water projects up and running, let's say I had a cost basis in 2014 of $100 a barrel, 25 of it is, is operating costs. So the, the variable cost is 25, the fixed cost is 75. Shale is the opposite. This stuff is just 100% variable cost. There's, real, there's a tiny bit of a fixed cost in there but it's just spend the money and turn it on. Which is what, that's the reason why we use the word new oil order, because it was that view that that fast cycle nature of capital is what changed. But I guess where I'm coming down is, is, is that, actually go back to this picture. 
yes, that's true for this flat part of this curve. Well, what I'm beginning to realize is that everybody around that curve is coalescing to that group, so everybody looks like shale. Yes. <coughs> yeah, uh, I guess I had two questions, maybe interrelated. Uh, to what degree do these forecasts ad account for other countries taking advantage of shale deposits? Uh, and then the second, have you guys thought about the implications of this for electric cars? The um, first beginning with the, the others was the shale deposits. Basically, your big candidates are Argentina. They're in there, but they're relatively small. And Russia is the other big one. But I like to point out with Russia, they got so much conventional resource, exhaust their conventional resource before moving to the unconventional. So you have a lot of cheap, I mean, stuff that's $10 a barrel, um, which is why that um, at this point right now, any of these high cost technologies are out the door because you've got so much of that type of low cost conventional resource in places like Russia. Now, turning to the, the, the point on the, the, the EVs, uh, the, the question is one, penetration, and then the battery technologies. Uh, yeah, at this point right now, yeah, I have a lot of question about the viability of, of the battery technology. In fact, we have a picture that we show Moore's Law on processing, and it's, you know, the line going up like this. Then you have storage actually progresses better than even processing, better than Moore's Law. What does battery technology do? It's a flat line. You can't see it. And we got over 100 years of investment in battery technology. Started with lead batteries, nickel cadmium, lithium, and so on down the line. The only improvements you get is with the metal that you use. And so at this point right now, the best technology is in the lithium. And I'd like to point out, as you ever see that movie, Quantum of Solace, the second Daniel Craig James Bond movie, is filmed in Bolivia. 50% of the world's lithium sits in that lake, that, that, uh, that white lake that that movie was filmed. And so when we think about, you know, you trade with electric cars, given current battery technology, you trade the Middle East for Bolivia. You know, you got 50% of the concentration. The other thing too, you look at Tesla, it consumes 30% of the world's lithium market right now. and produces like 75,000 cars a year. So there's real concerns about, you know, can battery technology accommodate the availability to really scale up EVs? Oh. Okay. I guess just a quick follow up. You mentioned Argentina. How much do you really see? Thank you. My question was how much do you really see volumes getting pumped out of places like Argentina or Russia where they start laying out capital for shale? changing that equilibrium price and that flat part of our supply curve here? And what's our potential for disruption there? I would say relatively small. The disruption has already been paid for by the industry. You know, get me creating that, that mismatch between balance sheet and, and, uh, tech, uh, and, the, and the cost basis. You know, in terms of, at this point right now, those who can go into Argentina are doing it. But Argentina is, I would argue, very similar to Russia. you got an enormous conventional resource base that's cheaper than the unconventional. Yeah, it, it's cool and sexy to be doing shale right now, but the reality is the old school conventional resource base in these places is cheap, is large, there is existing infrastructure. Go in there and do that first, then go do the, do the, 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 the more interesting technologies. So, great. <laughs>